Hey everyone, welcome back to the Trail Line Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Moglin. Joining me today is one of my favorite people to talk to about the markets, Jim Ropel, who is the founder of Ropel Capital Management, as well as GrowStockMentor.com. Uh, Jim, always great to have you on. Uh, it's great to start off the year here uh, with some optimism as well, which I'm sure we'll, we'll cover today. So uh, thanks so much for your time. Oh, dude, I'm fired up to do it. I think you do such a great job as an interviewer. And so I'm happy to be here. I love doing it. And um, let's get it done. Yeah, let's dive right in. And uh, I actually went ahead and asked, you know, our viewers, our listeners, as well, people on Twitter, uh, what they most like to ask you. And I probably the most asked thing was, uh, what advice would you have uh, during the next, you know, the start of the next bull market, whenever that comes, whether, whether it's right now, and we'll, we'll definitely discuss that. Um, but what advice do you have for the next bull market so you don't mess up that transition and, and you make the most out of, you know, the next big run? I would not be in such a tremendous hurry to run because you're probably going to make more mistakes. And I would say have faith in yourself because if you don't, you won't have the confidence and you'll, if you don't think you're worth it, you'll blow it. Believe in the system, believe in yourself, believe in the American system that we operate under the golden goose of capitalism. You know, I'll just, I repeat this all the time, unless it's crushed by socialism, we're going to have another Starbucks, another Tesla, another Blackberry, another McDonald's. The, the, the system we live in just births all these opportunities for us. And everyone's like, you know, the next 20 minutes, the interday chart. If you, you need to, everyone, I started in 87, in 85, actually. And I've compounded my money out for that. Well, I, that's not true because I was, I was a big loser learning how to do this for a long time, but I'm 58 years old today and I love, love, love what I do. I believe I'll do it for at least 30 more years. And, you know, if there's a bull market every three years, that's 10 more bull markets. And if there's 20 more TMLs in every bull, that's 200 opportunities to go from first class to private jet or from bike to car or, you know, rented house to beautiful condo. These, so believe in yourself, believe in the system and chill. I mean, it, I ran the numbers the other day and I'm going to probably get this a little wrong, but if you had $50,000 and you compound it out at 15% for 40 years, that's $16 million. Okay. Now let's assume that along the way you have a 100% year like you did in 2020 or 07 mm -hmm. and 15% is pretty simple for, you know, for somebody who's not running a tons of money, you don't have to hit too many Broadcoms and Teslas to get seriously rich. Um, confidence in yourself, confidence in your system, confidence in the American way. And just chill. It's going to happen. Stop with the micro focusing. That kills me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but my key point to compounding, though, is you have to make sure that you know you, you don't get devastated in the bear markets when they do come. So, do you have any any tips and advice to make sure you know that your drawdowns are within reason? You know, during those periods where we're just chopping sideways or or you know pulling back hard like we did in throughout twenty twenty two. So, I mean, it's not a secret. Bill O'Neill was really guiding light for me. I mean, everything I know, I learned from him. I didn't innovate anything. The, yep. the Japanese had it right, just knock somebody off. And he was great at standing on the accelerator at the right moment. But he would change his position fairly quickly, very quickly, if things weren't working. So following the rules, you know, your simple guardrail is the 50-day moving average. Yeah. If you're only dealing with securities above the 50 in an uptrend, you don't use too excessive of margin and you stay in the leaders, you know, the high comp rating stocks, the more so the high RS. There's a huge debate in the can slim hedge fund world right now. It's raging. I had an hour and 30 minute call about it today. And that is how important are, is a new high. And I, I personally believe N and Can Slim is imperative. I believe every time you 
give up one of the variables and cancel them, you reduce the probability of success or you make it more difficult on yourself. But simply following the sell rules, when the market starts to go south, keep a running tab of your last 10 stocks. Are they higher or lower from where you sold them? Let the market tell you how many climax runs in 2000 in the in the 2000 top i was so fortunate i hit a huge string of climax runs and i just sold into them and i was fortunate to get out it was easy to get out that way the drawdowns that you sometimes have to take between the high and the 50 day are significant before they break through it yeah so uh experience in a hedging strategy look you, you you're just not going to do as well the first couple times you go through a bull and getting out as you are after you've been doing it for 30 years. Yeah. Um, but you'll learn and you're going to, most likely you're going to make a lot of mistakes for the first five, six, seven years. I mean, it took me a lot longer, but I think it's only because I tried so hard. It's not because I'm smart. It's because I put my hand on the hot burner and Pavlov, you know, to burn the hand. Yep. <laughs> and, but I had to relearn those lessons. Read John Boyk's book. If you're really yeah. tired and you want to go to sleep, um, it chronicles how I lost all my money a couple of times before I, oh, listen, I'm taking 20 minutes to answer your question. How do you stay in the game and compound? You don't lose in bears. And it takes some learning and some experience. Um, I think if you, if you're, listen, if 15% is fairly simple to, easy it's it's hard work but it can be done without a lot of excessive uh ex, ex, talent to start to do 25 percent or 30 percent you're going to have to use a lot of margin and i think if you can get out of a bull market as it's cresting and capture 80 percent of what you earned in other words only draw down 20 percent off the top you're doing an excellent job if you're using heavy margin Mm -hmm. And if you're going to have excellence, how about outstanding numbers? You're going to have to use margin, but at the bottom of every disaster hedge fund is almost always margin and ignoring your sell rules. Um, and so, look, okay, I'm going to, you got to give me a little leeway here. Yeah, go ahead. Peter Brandt, Nicholas Darvis. And Sequoia, three absolute monster compounding machines, gigantic. One thing they all had in common, I'll give you, it might, might be a little hard to guess, but give me one guess. I'm not putting you on the spot. Yeah. yeah. They didn't watch during the day. Mm -hmm. They put their buy and sell limit orders in. Tomorrow I'm going pheasant hunting with my really good friend. I'm going to give him a few stop orders, buy stops and sell stops. I'm going, I'm going to hunt pheasant all day. I'm not going to watch. So all this crap behind me, all these charts, I put that stuff in here 20 years ago when I was a rookie. I, it's all, I, I really think it's a distraction. Mm -hmm. So how do you get out? You pick your sell stop before you enter the trade or before the market's open and you let the market take you out. You remove the emotion because when the, it's like the book, it's like in Bill's book, when you have a turkey trap, you know, with the stick yep. and a turkey walks in and there's another one and one walks out. Well, do you wait for the next turkey to walk back in or you pull the stick down? You know, you got to set the number. If it's three turkeys, you pull it. Right. How about 20 minute answer to a one second question? No, it's, it's expected, but it, it's awesome. And um, taking a step back, uh, we mentioned before we press record, or you mentioned that, you know, we're kind of at a potential turning point here in the market. So, you know, looking at the big picture, what are you kind of seeing both on the macro side, as well as, you know, what the existing leadership and themes that could be emerging right now, what are you seeing with regards to the market? And, and what do you think about the overall health right now? I think it's, a, we're at a critical juncture. I mean, I'm always ready to flex with the market, no matter what, but oh, here for the first time in over a year, and I, I write this newsletter called Growth Stock Mentor, and I have a lot of bears in there holding balls underwater and just pictures and graphics and springs compressing. The very first page ahead of any uh, text, I put a, a bull 
it's the first bull that's been in my newsletter in over a year. Mm -hmm. But at the exact same moment, we're in a high, high danger point. The S&P is at a little over 4,000. It's right at, at long-term downtrend line. 4,100 is the prior high. There's all this resistance. We are dead in resistance. It is the likely place for a top. But if we break out, we could have a strong move up. The issue I see is I don't think anyone's been scared out. The public has been buying stock. We have not. The VIX hasn't spiked. The put to call hasn't spiked. The internal buying pressure is not that good versus selling pressure. It is improved. The new highs are just barely exceeding new lows. They've just started to improve a little bit, but they're only a little bit better than they were in August. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, look, here, the dominant, we can talk about the dominant fundamental factor, which is critical, but we'll skip that for the second. Mm -hmm. Volume matters greatly, but it is trumped by price. But that's trumped by can you make money? And it's very, very difficult to make money right now. AXOM, AXOM broke out and it reversed and pulled back in. You know, we, we've had significant rotation under the hood where it's the industrials. And then now all of a sudden growth stocks are ripping. Don't, it, it can't be lost on anybody here. The Goldman Sachs most short index, which is the most heavily shorted stocks has been rocking. It's up 17% for the year. Well, that's a short covering rally. We are in a short, that, that is screaming short covering rally. Without wearing anybody out or, or, or scaring them out and the public's buying, no VIX, no put to call, no heavy volume bottom panic. It's hard for me to believe the market's going to let everybody just make a killing. Um, but I'm a trend follower. But beyond that, I have to be able to make money and I've only made money in, in my, in my gold and metal positions. Mm -hmm. And my number one idea, which is for advanced traders is if we've had a long run into resistance, if we have a gap up reversal on the indexes, I am going short. I've been, I've made more money doing that than almost anything in the last year and a half. <laughs> yeah. And just for everybody watching, we're recording this on Monday after the close, just for some perspective. I will have to see how this week plays out. Um, I'd love to hear, Jim, what are kind of your top ideas right now, uh, your top positions, and what, what kind of themes, overall themes, are you most excited about if we do get, you know, a, a sustainable rally that, that does progress, um, you know, further from this point? So there's fundamentals, which I believe in but I must have them corroborated by the new high list. I mean, your new high list is the gold bar list kind of combined with relative strength. If you have any idea, I'm going to give you a thematic idea. If the stock's going to work, it's got to get into the new high list. And if it's going to go from 50 to 300, it has to make a new high all the way there. So whatever I'm going to say must be corroborated by new highs and, and, and it's, you know, great relative strength. But I think mobile eye, any stock that can come out in a really, really bad bear market, it, it might be one of the only that has uh, come out of any significant quality. It is, and listen, Tesla can go dormant for 10 years, and I think it might. It's had a double TML, a TML mm. digest, and a TML again. There's only a 2.7% probability of a TML reoccurring, and it, it did it. It might have, it's one of the greatest stocks in history. It, it's, it can go dormant for 10 years and, and still have great sales. But Mobileye is just selling them components for, you know, for, for the, for the, uh, our, the, the vision system, autonomous driving. Yeah, yeah. So I like that very much, but it is choppy, very choppy and uh, erratic. So the, it needs to calm down a little bit. Uh, I'm huge in gold. My biggest position is gold and silver. I like the miners better than the, the uh, GLD or SLV, but I own them all. But your miners are high beta gold. And, uh, you know, semiconductors had a great day today. I think, is it ACLS is, looks really mm -hmm. interesting. And there's some others. I mean, I almost bought NVIDIA today, but it's so far off the high. It's disturbing. I like DR Horton. And that's a leading indicator for the economy. You know, uh, it seems so counterintuitive. How could 
mortgage rates go from 2% to six or seven, and the home builders are starting to catch, get traction. And that's a leading indicator for the economy. Maybe they're saying that rates are going to fall in the end of the year. Uh, ugh, I like oil service stocks. I like Schlumberger a lot. Uh, I think Tidewater for a super small mark micro cap looks interesting. Um, there's a bunch of ideas right now, but here's the thing. You don't, well, here, on a more thematic look forward, Something like Nor Norville, Nor Nordisk, they have this drug called Ozempic for obesity. 75% mm -hmm. of the population is either overweight or obese. I don't, I, I have a lot of friends and I only have one. I call him the thin man because he's such an odd, unique person. Everybody I know is five to 50 pounds overweight. This drug, the, the total addressable market for an obesity drug is, it's got to be the biggest market in the world, it, it in my opinion. I mean, what what does seventy five percent of the world need besides food? <laughs> An obesity drug, uh, and the drugs, the biotech drugs that we're seeing, are more curative than treatments. The new ones that are going to be coming out. So I think biotech is going to be absolutely ripe and rich with new developments. But I I I learned a lesson about that. I'm going to jump off screen for half a second. Yeah, no worries. I I keep this. Right by my desk all the time. And can you see, does it say Senecor on there? Yep, I saw it right yeah, at the top. Upper, look, Senecor rises on FDA victory. So they had a drug called Centoxin, which was supposed to cure septicemia, which is what most people die from in the end. But the review committee, I'm sorry, the, the full FDA committee declined to give it an approval, which is a super oddity. Biotech without an FDA approval and sales is a minefield. These are mostly research labs with no product, no sales force or anything. It's live or die by clinical trials and review committee. So absolutely, in my opinion, you have to have a basket of these to spread your risk or get through the FDA process and then sales. There's mm -hmm. plenty of room afterwards. Amgen, one of the greatest winning stocks in history. First earnings report, a penny. 32 cents against a penny. There was a 32,000% increase in earnings and the stock went crazy from there. So again, the addressable market was amazing, but biotech I think is phenomenal. Um, I don't think electrical technology is going to slow down and I can't not discuss crypto. I am extremely bullish on crypto. I have a crypto hedge fund. I am long crypto big time. So I'm not just talking. I'm, I'm with you in this thing. So I, I think the I'll tell you this, I think the largest market cap crypto coin might not even be ICO'd yet. I think there's there will be, in my assessment, coins that are going to have trillion dollar market caps, single coins. And I'm not talking about Bitcoin. The, con the industry is in such infancy, the whole market cap is a little over $1 trillion today. Microsoft's bigger than that. Mm -hmm. So the upside here, we're in about 1990. 94 in equity terms. And I, I worked at Morgan Stanley. I was uh, did a lot of IPOs in the late 90s. Uh, and I watched the build out of the internet. And I see the roadmap is almost identical to the build out of the internet. And so, you know, imagine today, well, let, let's put it this way. In 1995, if you would have bought a million dollars worth of, with, of uh, spread it all over the internet, you'd be a billionaire today. Yeah. So if you if you just buy a, a a mixed portfolio of high quality crypto projects and if they, you know, get too far off the highs or fall out of the top 40 market cap and you just reallocate back in there, I think you've got an absolute I think this is I I actually think this is as big as is biotech, maybe bigger. <laughs> How about that? There's a that, few ideas. Yeah, that's good. And, uh, you know, to touch on the risk with bio uh, biotech, I think CPRX today gap down. Uh, that was a name that I think a lot of people are watching. It happens. So you, you got to be you got to be ready. 30%. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the stock I told you about Senecor on the FDA review committee, it went from like 18 to 60. And when the FDA shot it down, it fell to five. Yeah. It's all or nothing. You're you're it's all or not. And that's a perfect example. I was going to I should have called that out. Yep. Yep. Oh, I got you. I got you. Um, 
to follow up on on crypto and everything um what what's kind of your overall uh you know strategy with that and is it similar to how you approach you know stocks you're looking at both the fundamentals as well as the price action or do you have a more of a long-term approach with your your crypto portfolio crypto is basically liquid well, not really like a public venture they're, they're deals that probably should be private and remain private, but because of the decentralization and the, the, you know, there's no control, these companies launch coins. So you have to look at it more as a venture type investment. I do follow trend in everything, but you know, the number, my number one indicator, I'm not a venture or an angel investor, although I do have a lot of money in this stuff is what is the developer community? The number one coin for developers is, is Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And another one that, I, again, I'm, I'm talking my book here. I'm long an ocean load of a coin called ICP, which was trashed so severely. It came out at four or 500. It went down to three. I, I hold all of it. I've never sold any of it. I took a little tax loss on some stuff I bought way high. But I, I mean, this much. I'm, I'm long. Their developer community is exploding. The, the, the develop, as crypto imploded the development community community continued to grow mm -hmm. and i hear all these people it's a scam it's a fraud and i'm talking about people who are on tv who should know better they're screaming from the rooftops at the dead low that you're an idiot if you own it and that's a total bottom signal um look equities need an ftx we need the lehman moment now crypto's had the lehman moment Three Arrows, Luna, all the supposed in the know people saying it's a scam at the dead low. We have a huge run up. I'm not saying the bottom is in, but I I, I think we may retest it. I don't know, but we're go I believe greatly we're going to go way higher. And I think crypto is going to bottom way before equities. I don't believe equities have bottomed yet. Um, so we need the public to vomit up their stock. And they have not we need that ftx moment in equities to put the bottom in yeah. and listen if we don't get a lehman moment and you see 30 stocks break out in high high quality and go i'm not going to wait for the lehman moment in equities i'll yeah. follow the trend in the leader how many leaders are emerging major major signal like bill would go time to put the hammer down now he was an expert at, at knowing when to take a big position or to, or to probe and test. And don't be so macho that you have to buy the thousand lot. Right. Bill O'Neill traded hundred lots all the time. And if he could trade a hundred, so can you. <laughs> yeah. And I want to ask you, you know, during this bear market, um, what are kind of your routines and also screens that you're running you know, to, to try to keep track of emerging leadership and stocks that could become big leaders. You mentioned the new high list, which I know is a big one, but is there anything else, you know, gap ups on volume that you're looking for? Huge. You know that, yeah, yeah. But that usually comes in earnings season, which we're in and earnings season is, earnings season could be the clue that breaks the, the S&P out of its downtrend or, or rolls it over. Right. This is big, but leading RS line, absolutely points you it's like a divining rod to water it just it sends you right to where you want to go rs is critical gap ups like you said comp ratings i mean liquidity up, up to down volume i run up to down volume all the time and then i run uh volume percentage up on the day and you really can kind of tell like i watch pre-market a lot mm -hmm. because i want to see what ripping and it's like it's it points straight to the needle in the haystack where everything's doing little, uh, very little activity, but then you have one or two stocks that are going goofy. That's where I want it. And then I, I'll watch the first 30 minutes and then I'll try to get away from it. I'll work out and go about my day, try to read. Uh, and I like to more check in than stare at the market. You know, yeah. I think it was Ed Sequoia or some, you know, legendary trader said, Watching the market all day is like having a slot machine on your desk. You're going to, you know, start pulling that arm. So ask me the question again. I totally spaced. Did you ask my routine? Yeah. Routines and screens to kind of track leadership and, and emerging leadership. Number one screen, 
new high list relative strength, up to down volume, earnings get a uh, surprise is an integral part of every TML. I mean, the definition of a TML is six to eight quarters of beaten raise. If you put 20% of your whole account in a stock and you can sit through five to eight beaten raise quarters, you're going from one bedroom house to three bedroom house, you know, first class of private jet. Yeah. How many times do you need to do that in your whole life? If you did that, if you're 40 years old and between 40 and 80, you caught six of them and handled them right. And again, this goes to duration of hold. The average person holds a stock. I think I saw a study by the New York Stock Exchange. The average person holds a stock for what, 20 days or 10 days or something. How are you going to, how is someone sitting for five to eight quarters of beaten rays if you hold the stock in an average of 12 days? That's cuckoo. Livermore, it's the big money is in the sitting. Yeah. I don't want to live on a razor's edge. You know, um, I was building a house a long, long time ago in 99. And um, I told my dad, I wanted to knock a tile out and put a clear glass pane so I, and with a shelf on the, so I could watch quotes while I'm mm -hmm. showering. And my dad's like, have, have you lost any sense of quality of life? Do you want to live on the razor's edge? And, and, and I, it didn't really resonate with me. I was still in the get rich business then. Yeah. But if you sell every gap up and every wiggle and jiggle, you have to put the money back to work, which means now if you have good risk management, you have to watch it like a hawk because you're always one second away from being stopped out, which means you're 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 chained to your computer. Who wants to live li like that? I mean, you're that's no. It, how about it might be fun, but it's no way to make a fortune. It's the mm -hmm. sitting. Yeah. Twenty minute answer. <laughs> no, it's good. It's good, and um, you know. There's actually a highly requested question that that I thought was really interesting. What were kind of the the five biggest stocks that changed your life? The the true market leaders that you really handled correctly and you know help helped you really make progress in your account. So it's so funny you to ask that because somebody last night put an article. I was in IBD in the it was a full page thing about my Broadcom trade and it was the first stock I made a million in one trade. And that was in like 99 or 98. So, you know, what is it, 20 plus years ago? That was the foundation of my war chest. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I'm going to diverge from things. I grew up, I'm wearing a pair of jeans that are ripped straight through the knee. But when I was a kid, I got a couple pairs of jeans a year. And if I tore the knee out playing football, my mom would have to put a patch on it, like Wrangler blue jeans patch. I didn't have any money and I thought, and I live in a pretty wealthy town and I saw these rich kids and I was like, God, I want to be rich someday. And when I opened after the Broadcom trade on New Year's in 2000, I opened up my laptop and there was like $1.3 million in there. Now, if you would have told me five, 10, 20 years before, if I would ever in my whole life have $1.3 million, whatever the heck it was, I'd be like, I'm golden. I'll never be sad again. Well, that is completely not true. It's not true at all. The happiness in my life has not come from money. As a matter of fact, it's made my life more difficult. The happiness has come from my friends. That trade kicked ass. And I, I go back to it and I'm like, that was it. That was the start of everything. And I just took that money and compounded the crap out of it. And I had some bad drawdowns along the way. But so Broadcom was huge. SanDisk, mm -hmm. which I caught in an IRA, my wife's IRA, which has ballooned that thing up. Um, read John Boyk's book. Most of the big ones are in there, but my hedge fund made 30 million on Baidu coming out of a bear market. It had just an enormous string of weeks up in a row. Um, and the, the key was knowing the fundamental story. I read that something like 30,000 Chinese were going online per day. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that the government thought that Google was the um, going to dethrone the uh, the premier. So they, they canceled it and they rerouted all searches to Google to Baidu. So now I'm like, the government is funneling all these requests to them. And I'm like, you know, it, it just was such a un amazing fundamental story with an unbelievable total addressable market. The earnings were there. And I just, 
I took the mother of all positions in that thing. I was much more of a cowboy back then, much more so. Um, I, I would don't think I would ever take a position that big again. Uh, just read John Boyk's book. Most of them are in there. But yeah. every one of them had one commonality. Thunder earnings, massive total addressable market that I deeply, deeply understood. And I will tell you that some of these stocks that I bought, I bought because of gap ups on volume that were so thunderous. Uh, say, oh my God, uh, NVIDIA. I caught NVIDIA on the first gap up explosion breakout. And I think I bought like 270,000 shares in a day. And my my girl who runs my small fund, Eve Bobak, calls me. She's like, what are you doing? She's like, you got a giant position. They're going to report earnings after the close. She's like, you've lost it. I go, yeah, I go, they're going to report it. I go, this is, this is not, they're not going to miss. And they crushed it and it exploded up. And I, over the coming year or so, I kind of, it depends on how you look at it, but I trimmed off a little bit before every earnings report. So some people would say you would have never been able to sit with that much exposure as it, it, it the thing went wild. Yeah. So it maybe helped me sit. But had I stayed with that, <laughs> I would, you know, have been crazy. I, I had a lot of, a lot, lot, lot of stock in that one. So that's one that I don't think is in the book or it might be, I'm not sure. Yeah. And <laughs> I don't know. Are you a little bit more focused on, um, you know, recent IPOs in the past three years and you're kind of diving into their story right now? Or um, are you just kind of looking for those liquid leaders or, or you know, whatever comes across your screen is, is what you're going to take? Uh, but are, my, I guess my question is, are you more focused on the stocks that have come public more recently, yet that kind of belong to those themes that you're kind of looking at? I do not, but I don't have to mm -hmm. because the characteristics of a true market leader are going to be present where they're present. I don't search for IPOs, but when a, it's not a fluke that I was in Google and I, I've been in several of the monster IPOs, mm -hmm. not because I was looking for them. They just met the criteria. Um, I am a liquidity junkie because I'm running three funds or two two equity funds, and my so I need significant liquidity. So I'll, sometimes I will sacrifice. Like AEHR is a flea of a stock, yeah, and it's probably one of the, the big leaders, but it's just something I can't really buy. So I will frequently go to a more liquid name in a specific category that is has wind in its sails. So. That's just the evolution of growth. I mean, uh, you know, size crushes performance, the bigger you get. But I'll tell you, my fund, I think you can really only run with the liquidity in today's present market. A couple hundred thousand, a couple, mil, couple hundred million. I think you get over 200 million in a can slim based fund where you're going to concentrate in five or six stocks. So you're really up against the maximum that you can handle, especially if you're going to use margin, you have 200 million on margin. Now, all of a sudden you're really, you're as big as a lot of may, you know, hedge, um, uh, mutual funds, but you're putting all, they'll be in 30, 40, 50 stocks and you're putting it all in five, right? That really, I don't ever want to be more than five to 5% 5 of average daily volume. But I think the, I'm going to deviate. I just have to say this Yeah. right now. We are in a major asymmetric moment. If you are a CanSlim practitioner, you are probably somewhere between five and 25, 30% long. I, that's my, my opinion. And that would be pretty bold here. I don't believe you can justify that much exposure with the uncertain, the level of uncertainty until we emerge out and definitively have confidence. But you should not really draw down more than single digits in a year to test if the new bull market's are going to emerge. Now we're already at least a year in. Now, if you go from the day the eight advanced decline line topped, which was when growth tops, we're two years into this bear. So I feel like I'm risking single digits, maybe seven, eight, depending on how aggressively you test to have my biggest years are right after bears. So I'm risking three, four, five to 10% to make a hundred, yeah. 100, 200, at least 50. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I'm flipping a coin, lose seven or eight or nine or 10% to make 50 or hundred. I mean, I've been doing this. It's not a, I used to kind of sometimes say, well, is it a fluke that I made this money, you know, early on? But when you look after doing it for 30 years, it's not a, if you're implementing can slim and you're having success, it's not a fluke. 
So it's not like a 50, 50 chance up or down, lose eight, nine, 10 to make a hundred. It's like flip the coin, lose 9%. But if we have an upturn, it's like, you know, it's a very high probability. You're going to have a monster year here. I think the asymmetry in deploying a can slim method is so high right now. And it's the, it, people are kind of, yeah, the market, maybe whatever. This is when you should be crazy excited. Mm -hmm. the, the spring coil has been squished like this. And if we get another big leg down, this just is, I'm just going to get more excited. <laughs> yeah. I, and people I, are going to turn the other way. Yeah. I think, um, I don't know what, what interview it was uh, I did with you, but you used the rubber band analogy where the bear market stretches and stretches and stretches it. And the reaction is going to be bigger the, the longer this goes on and, and the deeper we go. If we get the public to puke, which they have not, if we get another big leg down and they vomit up their stock after this deep into a bear, I mean, you know, and I, I will say, and I'm, I'm segueing. If you look at wheat, you look at oil, the equity market, the defense stocks, Lockheed Martin, uh, whatever, they're acting like the war in Ukraine is over. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to suggest that it's not only not over, it's ramping, okay? The tensions are rising. We agreed to give Bradley fighting vehicles. We agreed to give them uh, armored personnel carriers, howitzers. They're in Europe discussing giving them leopard ass <laughs> tanks. This is escalating. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference, you know, a lot of people are like, well, you know, Saddam and we went in there and kicked his ass. Putin is not Saddam. And Saddam didn't have nukes. Like the downside of, of Saddam losing was he got mulled over. If Putin starts to lose, he's backed into a corner. The possibilities of what he might do, like I assess the possibility of, of seeing nukes, him deploy some type of low power tactical nuke at at over 30% if he loses. This isn't Ukraine against Russia. This is US against Russia. It's NATO against Russia. Yeah. And this is escalating. This is not, it's going the wrong way. I think if you take large equity exposure, especially into the spring and early summer when Ukraine gets trained on these armaments and this ramps farther and you start to go long the market, you better have black swan puts. Because if you wake up and and you see 10, 30, 10 to 30,000 people killed in a nuclear attack, you could have oil gap up five days in a row, wheat gap up, whatever, and the equities could gap down. We could lose 20% overnight, you know? And so this is a very, I am not a bear. I'm a massive bull optimist, yeah. but I'm not an idiot either. <laughs> I yeah. mean, risk management is job one, whether it's a single stock and cutting your losses, or your whole exposure to the market. We are in a very dangerous moment with this war. This is the biggest war in my assessment. It's basically two superpowers head to head right now. And it's escalating. I yield the floor to my great <laughs> commentator. <laughs> no problem. Um, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned optimism and there was a really interesting question um, related to that from somebody. Uh, they basically asked, you know, was that something you kind of learned over time and like developed over time, your, your optimistic perspective? Or were you just kind of like that from the start and, and that kind of helped you, you know, overcome those obstacles early, early in your career? I had a, I don't want to get too deep, but I had a rough time growing up as a kid and I just had to, I, I didn't want to turn to the dark, to the negative. And so I find life is way easier, much more enjoyable. And, you know, I've never seen a successful pessimist pessimists seem like really smart. They have all these cogent arguments and super logical, and they usually retire very middle-class optimists who back their bets with capital. They live on ocean fronts in mansions. I want to roll with those people. I want to party with the, with the guys <laughs> who want to have fun and smile and, and see the possibilities. If you, you can't make a possibility occur if you can't see it. But anything you can see, you can make happen. If you see, all you see is negative and the, and the end of the world and, and problems and this isn't going to work, that's going to be your life. I'm not living that life. It, 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 psychology, forget money. If you have an optimistic mentality, even in poverty, you can be a very happy person. I, I want to be with those people. 
I, I, forget those negative dudes. Get that toxic guy out of your life. <laughs> yeah. And and it, it helps you look past the bear market too and, and be ready for what's next and, and be ready for all, all those different opportunities. It helps you sit. Mm-hmm. When you say, wow, no, no, NVO's um, total adjustable market is, call it one of the biggest markets in the world, and you sit for six months and you're like, ugh, but the play's not over. You ha- When you see the possibility of a four-year, five-year play and it, you can sit, you have to, only an optimist can see these giant markets and not go, that's never going to happen. Yeah. It, it allows me to sit because I, I believe in technology and innovation and, the, and I'm in the American way. And I believe... It is going to crush all these dictators. The worst thing in the world for a dictator is success broadcast on the internet. That is every, everyone in these countries is like, well, wait, what's going on over in the United States? They have all these cars and houses and air conditioning and electricity. And they're like, why don't we have that? But the prime, the uh, imperial wizard is living in a castle that's made of gold and everyone else is living in the desert. You know, technology is the worst enemy of these despot dictator scumbags. And it's gonna ramp, it's only ramping. I did a um, graft, the rate of patents filed for in the US. It's ramping, it's it's not linear, we're accelerating. So little optimism for you. <laughs> yeah, great. And um, this is a question I really wanted to ask you. Uh, let's say the market starts turning 30 stocks break out. We're seeing, you know, the support we need to sustain a new uptrend. Um, and you catch, you know, a potential model book stock on an earnings gap perfectly. You buy it right. Uh, you've got a, a good size position. Um, what can you say to help uh, traders in that in that position to help make sure that they manage it correctly and, and don't cut loose something that could, you know, change their year, change, you know, change their life? You have to understand the average life of a TML, I did a study going back like 56, many decades. The average length of that run was I think 97 weeks was somewhere in the nineties, like 97, 98 weeks. As long as you don't violate that 50 day by more than five, 6%, you need to, I don't know why the number is in the, it's 95, 97 weeks. I don't know why those beat and raise quarters, you have to sit, you and knowing the fundamentals, uh, but if it goes south on you, like recently we had shockwave, uh, there's been th- uh, end phase, uh, Celsius, Celsius is starting to act kind of funky. Mm-hmm. You could <clears throat> go, oh, this. Was like, I thought that shockwave's product was one of the greatest things I'd seen in a long time. It's an innovation. Um, the same with end phase. Well, we're a bear market and they got killed and maybe, they're, maybe the competition is going to usurp them. Never, the technicals must corroborate your fundamentals. As long as that stays intact. And Bill O'Neill um, said to me, Jim, I had a tr- trouble with a trade and I sent him the chart and he sent it back to me and he wrote on it. Any stock with triple digit sales and earnings can go way farther than anyone thinks and you can't sell it until it breaks the 50. So being in the right name, knowing the fundamentals, all the variables are all there the bull trend turns up, you get fortunate enough to get positioned. You cannot sell until it breaks the 50. Now on the flip side, if you are on margin and it gets too far above the 50, the to travel back down to the 50 might be too big of a drawdown for your stomach. Yep. So I strongly suggest hedging, whichever way you want to do it to, to dampen that volatility and the drawdown. Don't get out of your whole position or hedge it all because it could go into climax. Um, but hedging will allow you to sit, staying with it. And don't, ex- levels of extension are critical, but don't get out of them because they could flag. <laughs> yeah. And, you so, know, I, I think, yeah, it's really good. And, but um, and I know we've talked about this in the past, but people always kind of bring it up. And I'm sure somebody will mention this in the comments. How do you personally define extended from the 50 day? Is it based on you're looking at the past, just kind of using, you know, your eyeball, your fingers method, or is there like a percentage value that you're looking for that tells you, Hey, it's getting, it's definitely getting stretched at this point. Okay. 
there's two levels of extension. There's extension for the index and for an individual stock. Now there are moments like immediately following bear markets where the level of extension can go 13, 14%, 15% over the 50. Is it an irrational exuberance moment? Or is are you late in a bull? Because once the early bull exuberance phase of extension wear off, your market will jet NASDAQ will generally top about 7% above the 50. Now, individual stocks have personalities. If they're tiny, small float stocks, they can easily go 100, 200% over mm -hmm. and flag. And that 50 day will come back up to it. It won't go down. So the level of extension that is the market will allow in a base is ex very different than after the first breakout. So you have to know history for the stock. Where are we in the cycle? Is the stock just emerged out of a long, long base early in a new bull? And then you watch after the first breakout, is it 20, 30, 40, 50, 100% over? And you, you, you may have to guess that first time, but then you now know what the market will provide after the first pullback. The next one, you should expect similar activity, but you have to know yourself how much of a drawdown can you sit through? So even though you know the stock's probably still healthy, if you're like, I can't afford to lose that much money, it'll break my heart. You you know now, you, now you're taking some of that off the table. I don't mean hedging, I mean taking it off. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you, you said, how do you sit in these leaders? You have to have a disregard for what you can do with the money. I don't mean a disregard. I've said in history, historically, disregard money. Not true. That would imply no risk management. If you start counting up in beach houses or Lamborghinis or college educations or charitable donations, you know, you make that first million and you're about to make five and you sell it because you have to put it in perspective. Where are you in life? What's that? How many... I have another rule. If you have life-changing money, you have to take some of it because you never know what can happen. Life-changing money, the level up money, you have to nail some of that down. But having a disregard for what you can do with it is going to allow you to sit. That removes a lot of the emotion. Yeah. There's a lot of answers. I answered that question five ways. No, it's, it's good. Um, and do you kind of have a running calculation for each of the stocks when they get extended about, you know, how much of my account will draw down if this pulls back to the 50? Or is it kind of a mental thing uh, that, that you keep track of? It's called heat level. That's your yep. heat level. Yep. And I, my associate, Eve, is pretty big on the heat level. I don't like the heat level because if, you, if you're really focusing on heat level, you can't think, let things go wild. Mm -hmm. And it, for, it, you, you, you suffocate some possibilities, but it's a, it's a, I have a pretty high tolerance for pain where I think it's a lot higher than most people. Most people can endure that. And maybe most people should be more in Caterpillar and bigger cap, more durable <clears throat> names. They're not suited for Celsius and N phase and impinge and you know all these as aosl and all this stuff mm -hmm. they they should be an exxon it looks really good chevron looks very good right here slumberjay looks very good knowing what you if you don't know yourself the market's going to show you who you are really really quick and if you're not listening it's going to blow you out the market will expose all your weaknesses if you're greedy fearful egocentric whatever the market is going to the market is a silent psychologist. It will, it, it will poke in water finds its level. The market finds your level. Um, you have to know who you are and what you can deal with, because if you're trying to get rich in small cap names that are illiquid and you're a person who can't deal with volatility, you're going to get wrecked. Mm -hmm. And I think most people do get wrecked. Um, but anyway, there's a 20 minute answer again. No, that's good. Um, and I was doing an interview with uh, Charles Harris, uh, I think a week, a week and a half ago, and he mentioned um, a Tony Siba video that you recommended he watch way back at a, a master trader program or something like that, uh, that kind of opened his eyes to, you know, 
what could what could happen over the next decade, few decades when it comes to technology. Uh, could you touch on a little bit about kind of what that video kind of shows and, and, and the big takeaways for you and how that's kind of helped shape uh, what you're looking for in terms of uh, different themes? Okay, it that was a very seminal video. It was critical to, to, to my thesis. And it, it basically showed about battery technology and the a rate of adop adoption rates and Moore's law and all... Uh, but here, you guys should all watch the video, but here's the critical issue. You have to find the research that backs up the trend because every stock has a bull and a bear case. But what case is the market paying attention to? Whether the the dominant fundamental factors, it's a Richard, uh, Peter Brandt called this to my attention. Like right now in the in the U.S. equity market, the dominant fundamental factor is the Fed, and it mostly is the Fed. But there has been times when the twin deficits were the dominant fundamental factor. There's times when innovation or the debt ceiling or uh, some type of look <laughs> war, <laughs> war. Now the market's taken its eye off of it, and I was very very worried about the Chinese commercial paper market, the uh, KHYB was imploding. It, it blew up. It blew up so far below the 2020 low. I'm like, China's going to come undone. But I would tell all my listeners on GSM, this is a happening, but the market's not paying attention. So it doesn't matter that much. And it, now it looks like the Chinese mark, market is improving and the commercial paper market's improving and it, the world never got worried about it. Mm -hmm. So like, like the war, the world's not worrying about it today. So I'm not either, but I'm, I'm kind of taking some protection if I get long, but in general, I will follow the, I'm not going to go, Oh, I think the war's going to ramp. So 30 stocks broke out and I should be 80% long and I'm not going to do anything. I'm, I'm going long. You have to find the Tony Seba report that corroborates the trend. Mm -hmm. So Tony Seba is straight up an amazing, amazing. And he actually has a brand new uh, video out. I suggest you all watch it, but you should also all watch George Mearsheimer, uh, unheard podcast. It is, it will change your view on what, what may happen in Russia. So, but you have to fit it with the market. Yep. Simple story. Um, a war, a veteran trader had a research has been beaten up over many, many uh, cycles and he feels a new bulls emerging. And so he hires this rookie he goes, look, I hired you because you haven't been beat up. You're optimist and you could see potential. That's one thing. But the other thing he says to him is, write me a report on GM. And the kid goes, you want a bullish or bearish report? Everybody who buys stocks, someone sold it to you, thinks it's going lower. But you have to get in line with, look, the trend following. If you look at all the monster hedge fund, the goats, only one of the goats is a fundamentalist. I mean, he might not even be considered a goat that Michael Steinhardt was a fundamentalist. Warren Buffett is a fundamentalist, but Druckenmiller, Soros, Paul Tudor Jones, I mean, you know, and, and Sequoia and many others, most others are trend followers. If it's good enough for those guys, if I, if I only do half as good as some of them, I'm going to be just fine. <laughs> yep. Yep. And um, I, you brought up the Fed and I was going to ask you about that. Uh, kind of, what do you think, um, what are your thoughts on kind of what they're doing with, with raising rates? Where do you think they are in the cycle? Uh, how close are they to a pivot? Does that even matter? What, what what are your kind of thoughts with regards to the Fed? I look at three-month bills in relation to Fed funds. And I look at forward Fed funds futures. So it looks something like the, I'm not, I, I'm rarely smarter than the market. Now, Druckenmiller would say, you need to know where the market's going before it gets there. But I'm trying to answer your question. Housing stocks are running. So they, housing stocks, the market believes the Fed funds futures. Mm -hmm. The bond market is inverted. So I think the bond markets probably, probably has it right. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I would point you towards the Fed funds futures, but I am, I think the reshoring and nearshoring. My, one of my favorite, my favorite index in the world is EWW, is the Mexican market, and the construction stocks and CMEX. Now I hate low price stocks, but 
reshoring is inflationary and a very tight labor market is inflationary. So I personally believe that inflation is going to come down through destruction, but I think we have a more of a structural issue with inflation. And I think that the federal government borrowed trillions and trillions of dollars at whole dollar value, and they're going to want to repay it back with devalued dollars. So I think the way out of it, and now I'm extra, going tangential on you, the way we're going to pay this debt down is through inflation and growth. So I think a little inflation is good for that. It's just when it gets out of control, which could send everything sideways, which I'm always ready for. Um, as I say, I'm primarily always in the stay rich business and keeping my losses as tiny as possible. That's, you can't compound if you don't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there are a few people who want to know, uh, kind of what your process was like in 2022. How did you handle the bear market and what were kind of a few of the stocks that you traded, uh, both long and short, if, if you did any shorting at all? Well, let's, let's go to the more juicy part. In 2021, the advanced decline line peaked and growth peaked. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't not buy breakouts, even though I could have, but I didn't. So they would break out and whip all over the place and, and, and fail. So 2021, I was down bad. I learned my lesson by late 21, and I kind of was really remained almost all in cash for the last part of the year. But I was doing an interview with Arusha. Mm -hmm. And I just stopped him. I go, does this period in time remind you of any time in history? And everybody went dead silent because I think I knew what they were thinking. I go, it's exactly like 20, uh, like 2000 early. The market's being led by a handful of names. The advanced decline line peaked a long time ago. We're at the end of, we're in a bubble phase. And after that period, I really didn't do much. Now, I made 32 new entries in the year 2021, and I think I lost on 29 of them. I wasn't following my own rules. And this is key. Just because you have 30 years of great, of history, you know, on average, really, really good numbers, you could screw it up. Anybody can screw it up. I mean, after a year up where crypto went to Mars, my, my crypto fund went up many, many fold. My equity funds were both up over 100%. My ego was freaking on overdrive. And then, I, so I thought, oh, I, I pulled back a little bit in 2021. I can deal with it. I'll make it back, no problem. And then the, the whole grew and grew and grew. It took time for me to come back to earth and look at my trailing 10 wins and losses. So in 2022, I drew down single digits, big single digits, but single digits. I was in mm -hmm. cash almost all year. It was easy. The trend was obvious at that point, but it was 2021, which was the trick. You know, some people had great years that year because they were primarily like indexed out in, you know, Amazon and just the last few names that were going up. But under the hood, we had one of the worst growth bear markets ever in history. I mean, it, to me, it looked like 2000 Yeah, to me. You know, how many stocks are down 80% right now? That's major. So there's a, I, you asked me 2022, 22 was easy. The, mm -hmm. the market was living below the 50, below the 200. They were all just going, the trend was wildly down. Nobody should have missed that. The trick was 2021 in my assessment. Yeah, yeah. And um, you mentioned a few times during this interview, uh, looking at your trailing, you know, past 10 trades and looking, you know, how many were, were winners and and losers how do they do overall i think that's a really good simple metric to you know stay in tune with are you actually making money in the market um so for kind of newer traders out there who might want to incorporate that into their process what would you kind of recommend around around looking at your last 10 trades you put them on a sheet of paper get a legal pad and just go 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 um but here's the here's the thing even in 2021 my biggest winners were short arc, short calls deep in the money on arc. And now I think my number one trade, I might've said this right now, we're in a danger moment here. If this market gets rebuffed or we, let's say we break out because everyone's looking for this mm -hmm. and then it rolls over a gap open on an economic number or a, a big earnings report that runs the whole market. And then it rolls, you know, gaps up and reverses is a dead short for me. 
we are nowhere near in bull market zone. Okay, don't let's not confuse anything here. I I put the in the most recent growth stock mentor, I put the bull first because I had to say, look, this is a possibility that is emerging. But the reality is the bear is still the primary trend. And where's the 30 names that have all exploded out that are super high quality that are new TMLs? They're not there. We don't have them. It's oil. Okay. We have AEHR, which is a $1 billion flea of a micro cap. We've got Rambus. NVIDIA came out of a two-day digestion bottoming base, which is waterlogged. I mean... And this could all change. And I could, I am a, I'm, I'm long a lot of gold and silver, but I could be in, in five business days, I could be 80% long. If those names emerged, those N phase esque Celsius esque names or any group <coughs> emerged with power, like, okay, you've got to look at uh WWE that is hanging so tight and um, iridium looks great. I put a piece in my report, a fundamental piece on that in there. Those two stocks are a character change, but that's two. Mm -hmm. We need 50, we need 80, but we need, you know, 10 TMLs, but it's got to be backed up by the general market. Uh, you know, it can't be waterlogged, like uh, uh, what Apple broke above its downtrend line today. We need a lot more evidence. I mean, the new high, new lows have emerged with more new highs than lows net, but in a new bull market, they explode. Mm -hmm. I mean, explode. It's impossible to have a bull without that. And we, we're starting to see it, but it's so it's green shoots. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of green shoots running around, but they did in August too. Now they're a little greener than they were in August, but we're still there. We, we, there's not enough app. Now look, if you front run this thing and you get it right, you're going to do a lot better than me. But if you test every bull market attempt, a follow through day is not a new bull market. That's a fledgling attempt at a maybe. Mm -hmm. Eric Cole proved that only 33% of follow through days are money makers. 70% chance it's not. So you must tread very, very lightly until you are confident you're in a durable uptrend. The impatient FOMO person is the guy who's been buried. Those guys are the guys who are down 50, 80%. They, they've every follow through day they piled in and they've been wrecked. Yep, that's good. And um, there are a few questions about uh, specifically about Tesla uh, and, and what you think about both the price action as well as, you know, the potential that it could be a longer term compounder turning to something like Apple where, you know, it's not making true market leader runs, but it's a consistent uh, winner, you know, uh, you know, throughout those good, good, strong periods. All right. I have to tell you something. One person who I really, really listen to is Charles Harris. Okay. He, he, to me, when he speaks, I, I pay a lot, he, I pay a lot of attention to him. I completely disagree with Charles. And again, I disagreed with some other people when Tesla, after it had it first, its first climax run. Now I did re-engage, but I didn't catch enough of it. The statistical, I did the study. The statistical probability of a TML repeating is 2.7%. The statistical probability of it repeating twice is less. I don't want to fight those odds. Now the stock is waterlogged. The relative strength is in the single digits. Probably. I, I just, it, it, the, the, the fundamentals look amazingly <coughs> rosy, but the stocks doesn't corroborate. So it's an automatic no for me, even if it does someday reemerge because their roof tiles or their battery business or whatever else, you know, solar city goes wild. It might be 10 years. As a matter of fact, it's likely to be 10 years. And listen, right now you have, forget Charles and me, there are well, much bigger known legends with better records than us that are completely at loggerheads. They totally disagree. Mm -hmm. So I, and this is for everyone's knowledge. If you're getting research or a newsletter from somebody who's fundamental, get a research report that is primarily technical, that has some fundamental information because look, I, I guarantee you these giant names, I don't want to say who you guys probably don't know who they are, 
one of these guys are going to be really wrong <laughs> and they're legends. So you, you, you just can't go, oh, the guys, you know, it's Stan Druckenmiller. He's bearish or he's bullish. He cha- he'll change his mind in a, in a, in a snap. So yeah, there's I, I, Tesla. Yeah. I, to me, it's, I was short Tesla. I made a little bit of money shorting it and shorting options in it. I, I have, n- and I'm not going to short it here because the general market doesn't tell me to short anything, but I would certainly pick on it. I would pick on the NASDAQ. I would pick on uh, it, on the gap up reversal down. I will short the NASDAQ. I'll buy S triple Q. I'll short options in the money. Um, and those waterlogged past leaders like Amazon and Apple and Tesla are prime for this type of thing. Yeah. My opinion. I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's good to know. And I think it's important about, you know, listening to the market for sure. Um, and you kind of mentioned a few times, you know, flexibility is extremely important. You talked about how Bill could change his mind in five days um, and letting the market, you know, guide you and, and changing your, you know, not being too steadfast in your opinion to, to let the market really sway you. I think that's, that's really key. Bill was great at it. You know, he, he didn't really get, as far as I know, didn't get tangled up in bad bear markets. He was fluid with the market and, you know, if you can't change your mind on new information and if that's called fighting the market and you're doomed, you're doomed. You will, you're that's ego. I'm right. The market's wrong. And the market's going to just, it will teach you a very expensive lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I thought this was a really excellent question that somebody submitted. Uh, what is your most recent aha moment or lesson? What's something that kind of changed how you thought about something or, or change your perspective? Exclusivity selectivity, refining your buy list down to the very, very few names. Bill, when I would talk to Bill, he was invariably in the leader, the single one. So just because you go through the charts and you find 50 stocks that are in some semblance of a base, but they have they're missing this there, you know, there's, there's all the variables. You want everything. You can buy any stock you want. Why would you buy some with, so it's selectivity, selecting it, it reduce down your list and try to take the emotion out as much as possible by not watching so much. And if you see something that's right by a pivot point, you have to stay on guard and maybe you watch more pure, but, but just put a buy stop in. You guys aren't trying to buy some giant block of stock. That's a problem for me. You can use a buy stop order. Um, letting look, I, I'm trying to impose my method of being an intermediate term trend trader on other people, but I don't know many guys who trade for five points who have lasted very long. As a matter of fact, I almost every single one of them I know is gone out. They've lost, they, either they they were cooked mentally because it just was too fatiguing. Mm-hmm. But it's really hard <clears throat> to make four or $500 million, $5,000 at a time. You need, if you want to get seriously rich, you need to catch a stock that is going to go up 100 plus percent with 25 per 20% of your whole account in it. And you need to, and you need to repeat that. I, I you know, it's like, it's, I, I don't even remember what the question you asked me was. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it was your most recent aha moment or lesson. One of the big, it's, it's astounding how far I got. I be, I went along the road in this business before I recognized how important psychology is. I was already running a hedge fund before I really started to even grasp the concept of all my mistakes were because of my, my mental game up here. Mm -hmm. Um, The it's like golf. I think the similarities between golfing and the market are so parallel. And I hit on it before, but knowing who you are, why you do what you do, what are you in it for money? Are you in it for retirement or are you in it because you want people to go point to you and go, wow, he's successful and to get self-esteem. And I think a lot of people, I certainly was, um, won't even, they don't even know why they're in the game. 
Are you greedy? Are you fearful? Are you a gambler? There, there's a thousand maladies that will cause you not just to not cut your losses, but to sell your winners. <laughs> I mean, that's just as bad. Well, it's no, it's not quite as bad. It's cutting losses is job one, but it's a crime to be in a stock at the beginning of a new bull market, which we are probably very close to, and it goes up 20, 30%, and then you get out, you know, because it's a little extender, it wiggles, or in the middle of the day, Fidelity blows out 400,000 and it goes down $5. Like there's Gandhi days, Mother Teresa and Gandhi days. Mother Teresa and Gandhi went into a 7-Eleven or a bakery one day and were pissed off and yelled at the counter clerk. They were rude and inappropriate. Amazingly wonderful per people. We are using their name, discussing their name because they were so virtuous, but they had bad days. Stocks have bad days. They could go on to be Tesla or Rambus or BlackBerry. Don't freak out on an interday move. Literally, Fidelity says, hit the bid, let it go. And off they go with 400, 500,000 shares. They, they might sell it over three days. But if it doesn't break that 50, sit, maybe sell a little bit. Like I try to sell in increments of 15% of my whole position, mm -hmm. barring some catastrophic moment. So I, it's like a dimmer switch. I, it, it, it's breaking badly on giant volume. I'll let 15% go. If it goes down further or my order's ramming it down and then I get my order fills and it keeps going, I'll let rip with another 15%. It breaks the 50, I might let more go. I'm working out of it. Mm -hmm. But just because I see, and, and I'm the same thing. If I see a massive spike up, I work into it. I don't just commit a giant position to something. I'm, I am a dimmer switch. And, it, and I discuss this with Eve. I try to have an in-house rule where we cannot in, enter or exit our equity position by more than 30% of the whole fund. It keeps us from getting too greedy or too fearful. To it now, there are moments. Now, this is so important. What I'm about to say. There are rules, and then there are special occasions. Only experience will tell you what a special occasion is, and that's when you break a rule. I try to break rules less than two or three times a year, but when you run into a climax run, and in two days you have three or four, your whole name's climax. You might want to get out of the mark. You might. You're certainly getting off margin, and you are. You're gonna. You're gonna sell more than thirty percent of your whole account. There are panics, and so, uh, not moving equity by more than thirty percent is a pretty darn good rule. At least for me, it keeps me from doing stupid shit. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, it's all good. Um, and. I want to circle back. You've mentioned Ed Sakota a few times in this interview, which I think is the first time I've, I've heard you talk about him uh, per personally, you know, one to one um, outside of his section in Market Wizards. Um, are there any resources about Ed that you found, you know, do a really good job of explaining his style and, and his viewpoints on the market? Uh, he's got a song. He plays with the Bluegrass Boys on his banjo. But I mean, honestly, <laughs> listening to the lyrics is. It's an oversimplification. But if you just followed those, you'd be doing great. Listen, yeah. if you only bought stocks with comp rating above 90, above the 50-day moving average, and you cut all your losses at 357, I suggest you could be one of the best money managers. If you were in control of your emotions, you could end up being one of the best money managers in the world. I mean, Ed Sequoia lays out the basics. You know, I, you can go to his website, the trading tribe, but it doesn't look like there's hardly any activity. The answer is no. Yeah. yeah but he yeah. gives you enough. I mean, look, Bill O'Neill wrote a bunch of books on it, spoke publicly for 40 years and how many people can make it work. It's not, it's not the, the magical system. It's the magic psychology. That's the differential. Anybody can scan for a TML most people will FOMO in and buy extended or over trade, but it's the sitting, it's the psychology to grab the bench that is almost exclusively gained through experience and 
creating wealth so you don't flip over a 50 or 100 grand or whatever. It could be five grand or 5 million, depending on who you are. Yeah. When you're dealing with money, if you look at that tweet that somebody put out the other day and I said, look, the first million is hard, but it's not impossible if you follow the rules. The trick is the first million is probably a life changer for you and it's going to make you act in different ways. And that is, most people don't even know that. They don't even know why they're acting the way they're acting. So just by reading that and understanding, you're going to react differently. And maybe I should th double, I should think twice before I blow this thing out. Mm -hmm. That's my best assessment. No, that's good. And and yeah, I, I think everybody should listen to the Whipsaw song a, a few times. It's, 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 it's fun as well. Um, and um, yeah, we're, we're kind of getting down to it. I just wanted to kind of open it up to you. Is there anything else you really want to kind of pass on to everybody watching um, or listening to this, you know, given this moment in time or, or what's kind of going through your mind at, at this moment? Don't get too fired up about this market until it gives you more information. Never, ever, ever, ever give up on Can Slim unless you just realize that it's not for you and let someone else run your money. The, the golden goose of cat, I'll say it again, is a nonstop funnel of TMLs. It's in America. Only 3,000 people forsake their citizenship last year. We let in a couple million people legally and probably another 5 million plus more risk their life to come here. There's a reason. The economic engine of this country is like nowhere else. The rule of law, the opportunities. I ask cab drivers all the time, why did you come to America? Why did your family come to America? 90, almost every one of them says opportunity, a better life. But recently I've heard two drivers say to me, you think that there's problem with government here and there's corruption? He goes, try taking a look at any other country in the world, pretty much. If you don't grease the skids, know somebody in high office, you're not going anywhere. The corruption in foreign countries, the graft and um, malfeasance amongst leaders is on, we're, we're the greatest country in the world. We have the best equity dispersion of money. We have, we have the best of pretty much everything. And it's not going to stop. Don't let this, oh, the Democrats are this, or the Republicans are this. The, the, the forefathers were pretty darn smart. And they've created this monster that is gentrifying the world, literally. And it's just not going to stop. Um, don't get too negative. I, in my ride the wave plan, I have numbers giving you the heat index. You know the, And I often put plus one because if I'm a five, I need to ratchet up just a little bit to be slightly more optimistic. Be on guard. This bear market is long in the tooth. I do think we're probably going to see another leg down, but I'm not stuck on it. And anybody can do anything. If you guys could only understand what happened to me when I was a kid and how I grew up to be where I'm at, if I can do this, a learning disabled dyslexic kid and run three hedge funds, you guys can do it and you'll probably do it way faster. How about, how about all that? Yep. Good to, he good to end on a high note. Jim, thank you so much for, for your time. Uh, where can people reach out to you if they want to learn, learn more from you or, uh, you know, want to contact you? At, at Upticken on Twitter. I own Growth Stock Mentor with Adam Sarhan. Um, you can find me on the web. I mean, I, I do actually limitedly respond <laughs> to important people who reach out. Uh, not important people, people who have important questions. I, yeah. I'm getting to a point where I can't do it. And that's why I have growth stock mentor. I used to, I taught five caddies how to trade. One of them became a multi, multi, multi millionaire was a partner in one of my hedge funds with me. I can't mentor one-on-one -on -one in my office, 30 people. So I have growth stock mentor for that. So um, there's a long answer to, I don't really answer one-on-one -on -one questions, but if somebody asks something really important, I'll, I'll reach out to them. Yep. Perfect. Well, Jim, thank you. Yeah, no, thank, thanks for your time. I'm sure everybody watching enjoyed it as well. If you did, make sure to leave a like down below, subscribe to the channel, uh, check out Jim down below. His links will be in the description uh, and we'll see you guys in future videos. Take care.